rest of your platoon. Wasted, Sarge. And we will be too, sir, if we don't get the hell out of here. You hit Lorraine? No, sir. Then listen up. The chief is gonna jump in this tank, roll across the bridge, and blow up any inhuman son of a bitch dumb enough to get between him and the prophet of regret. Pull yourself together, because you're going with it. What about that scare? We've all run the simulations. They're tough, but they ain't invincible. Stay with the Master Chief. He'll know what to do. Yes, sir, Sergeant. There is only one Sergeant Johnson, and his military career and his exploits over the years are noteworthy for a number of reasons. So, today, we're picking the Service Record series back up once more and looking at the life and history of Sergeant Major Avery J. Johnson. Sergeant Major Avery Jr. Johnson, serial number 48789-20114-AJ, was a non-commissioned officer of the UNSC Marine Corps, who served during the insurrection and into the Human Covenant War. He served with various naval special warfare units, owed in no small part by his immense skill and proficiency on the battlefield. He is a notable member of the Orion Program, the UNSC's and ONI's first major venture into a super soldier program. He played extremely significant and vital roles during the entirety of the Human Covenant War and was present for both the very first battle between humanity and the Covenant and the very last. Avery Johnson was frequently very eccentric, giving rather bizarre and absurd speeches to boost the morale of his subordinates. However, as Contact Harvest demonstrates, he was also a no-nonsense NCO who cared deeply about the lives of his troops. In order to give his soldiers a better chance of surviving actual combat, Johnson believed in pushing them to their absolute limits during their training. He was best known for his typical gung-ho outlook on life, personal goals and his role as a leader amongst the Marines of the UNSC. From both his subordinates and his superiors, he gained a reputation, respect, and admiration for this. Additionally, he was regarded as one of the few individuals outside of the Spartan II program to develop a friendship with the Master Chief Petty Officer John 117, a soldier with whom he fought numerous times in the early and late moments of the Human Covenant War. He seems to respect every human fighting for humanity, including the Sangheili when they joined forces with the UNSC, as well as the Spartan Twos. On November 23, 2474, Avery Junior Johnson was born in the Greater Chicago Industrial Zone of the United Republic of North America. This sprawling metropolis encompassed areas that were once part of the American states of Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Marcille, his aunt, took care of him from the time he was six years old because Zone Social Services placed him in her care after her parents' bitter divorce. His mother's grief over his father leaving was so great that she was unable to take care of herself, let alone a six-year-old boy. By the time Marcille adopted Avery, both of her sons had grown up. As a result, he was dressed in many of the older clothes that they had worn when he was younger which didn't always fit because he was tall and had broad shoulders. However, his aunt put a lot of effort into sewing and patching so that Avery always looked his best, especially for church. When Avery was 19 years old, he joined the Marine Corps of the United Nations Space Command. As she bid him farewell, his aunt urged him to always do the right thing and encouraged him to make her proud. Avery utterly excelled as a Marine and was frequently selected for special training and missions. He had been selected to participate in the Orion Project, a collaboration between the Office of Naval Intelligence and the Colonial Military Authority, to create biologically enhanced super soldiers to stem the insurrectionist tide by the beginning of the 26th century. Avery was sent to Planet Reach and went through a series of bioengineering procedures and hard mental and physical tests. He was subsequently accepted into the Naval Special Warfare Sniper School as part of Orion and Navspec War, where he performed beyond his superiors' expectations. 
he learned to deploy in single occupant exoatmospheric insertion vehicles and became an adept close quarters battle fighter in addition to training as a sniper. As part of Operation Kaleidoscope, a campaign that's aim was to kill important rebel leaders, the then Corporal Johnson went to harvest. With the assistance of a spotter, Avery used the M99 stanchion rifle to kill Gerald Ander, the global leader of the Sectionist Union. He was able to kill Ander with a single shot as the truck that was carrying him passed by. Throughout his time with Orion, Johnson was part of numerous other classified operations against the insurrection. Operation Tanglewood was the last operation to be undertaken by the Orions and Johnson himself. The Orion project was then shut down in 2506 due to unrealistic expectations and high costs. Johnson would ultimately return to the Marine Corps, though continued to lead numerous black operation missions against the insurrections nonetheless. A formative moment in Johnson's military career happened in 2513 when the UNSC launched Operation Trebuchet, a comprehensive effort to disarm rebels in the outer colonies. On June 16th of 2524, the then Staff Sergeant Johnson led a Marine unit in an effort to neutralize the rebels' bomb-making capabilities on tribute as part of this ongoing offensive. After breaching a bomb-making operation in one of Tribute's struggling industrial zones and neutralizing the insurrectionists there, Johnson and his team quickly identified that an explosive had been mixed into the synthetic rubber treads of tires. They quickly added this compound into the Argus drone's databases, which tracked the same compound in skid marks from a 16-wheel hauler on its way to the capital city of Tribute. The hauler was traced to a Jim Dandy roadside diner where the Argus drones confirmed more explosive was within the diner itself. Johnson and his team immediately closed on the target to intercept, hopping back into their hornets and making for the capital city. Their crafts set up behind a multi-story office building with smoked glass across the highway from the Jim Dandy. Thermal images of the situation were provided by the drone to Avery. Once again armed with a stanchion sniper rifle, Avery prepared to take the shot. After waiting for the individual to finish his meal and leave the building, he shot straight through two of the polycrete floors of the office building that were reinforced with steel and struck the target at the apex of his sternum with the 15,000 meters per second round. The shot split the target in two. Staff Sergeant Brine's team landed and entered the restaurant while Avery's team continued to provide aerial coverage because the Argus was still showing a bomb. A purse where the man had been sitting was the source of this reading. The woman whom the purse belonged to had gone to the bathroom just as Brine was about to get it back. She grabbed a young boy to turn him into a human shield and produced a detonator, threatening to use it if the Marines didn't back off. Avery was given the order to kill the woman from his position, but he resisted because it would put the child in danger. Brian yelled that he would kill the woman himself if Johnson refused to take the shot. Johnson confirmed that he was firing, but said that just to stall, as Johnson waited for the opening that would reduce the likelihood of harm to the boy. Before Johnson had a clear shot, the boy's father lunged at the woman. In the struggle, the detonator was pushed and 39 civilians, including the woman, the boy, and three marines, were among the dead. The only survivor in the diner was Staff Sergeant Brine. As is often the case in trying times, Avery's problems were only looking to worsen. After this particularly unpleasant incident, Johnson briefly returned home to seek comfort and respite with the woman that had raised him. Unfortunately, upon entering her retirement property, he found the property was ice cold and that his aunt had passed away three days earlier. He discovered her body laid on her bed. The retirement residences had climate control systems that would activate in the event that the occupant passed away, dropping the temperature to freezing point to preserve the body. He was informed by staff of the retirement complex, whom arrived moments after he did, that she had died three days before and had not been moved due to a backlog of work that the staff were struggling to keep up with. He 
angrily left the complex and sought to drown his sorrows by drinking heavily. After eventually being thrown out of a bar for fighting with bouncers, he was found in a gutter by the UNSC Marine Corps recruiter, Lieutenant Downs. He was reassigned to the planet Harvest to train colonial militia. Unbeknownst to Johnson, only Section 3 Agent Lieutenant Commander Gillen Alsigny had also picked him and Staff Sergeant Brine to assist in setting up an anti-insurgency unit to look into recent disappearances of DCS freighters around Harvest. Avery would train the colonial militia as expected. It would turn out, however, that the freighters were not going missing due to insurrectionist activity, but due to another wholly unexpected circumstance. A freighter was organized and arranged to be left in a similar location to where the others had gone missing. This freighter was not unattended, however. Johnson would be concealed within, awaiting the would-be hijackers. While lying in wait on the baited freighter, he and Staff Sergeant Brine fought and defeated four bird-like extraterrestrials in the first official battle between the UNSC and the alliance of alien species known as the Covenant. Humanity had made first contact with an alien species, and it did not go well. Shortly thereafter, Johnson and Brine, along with the Harvest Militia, attended the initial negotiations between the aliens and humans. Additionally, they fought brute chieftain Maccabeus, his nephew Tartarus, and a number of grunts. He assisted Staff Sergeant Brine and Gillian Alsigny by holding off the brute ship Rapid Conversion long enough for the majority of the planet's inhabitants to flee to the Tiara, a station connected to seven different space elevators. Avery and Gillian would be romantically involved with each other, although it is unknown if it was a lasting relationship or just a moment of passion. Whatever the case may be, the Human Covenant War had begun, and marked the beginning of a near 30-year conflict that would see Avery being deployed to dozens of key battles and events across human-controlled space. Having already served 32 years with the Marine Corps at this point, already at the age of 51, Avery had no way of knowing that he'd be spending the next 28 years fighting for the very survival of the human race. A prominent part of Avery's early involvement in the Human Covenant War was centered around his mentoring of the young Spartan II super soldiers, the spiritual successors to the Orion candidates. Johnson was summoned to the UNSC Everest for a meeting with Vice Admirals Preston Cole and Michael Stanforth and Dr. Catherine Halsey. Johnson, a veteran of the First Battle of Harvest and a member of the Orion Project, had valuable insight into the conflict with the Covenant and the alien races therein. It was here that the existence of the Spartan Twos and their enhanced capabilities were made known to Johnson. Following some brief exchanges, enlisting Johnson's mentorage for the young Spartans, Johnson participated in Operation Silent Storm. During this time, Johnson began collaborating with the ODSTs of the 21st Space Assault Battalion, also known as the Black Daggers, as Task Force Yama traveled through slip space to their initial destination. Simulated combat was taking place between the Marines and the young Spartans. The Marines had initially demonstrated that they were utterly insufficient to compete with the Spartans during their training exercises. However, this changed when Johnson instructed them on unconventional and alternative combat tactics, and despite the Spartans' continued superiority over individual ODSTs, large numbers of well-coordinated attackers meant the victory was less certain. Colonel Marmon Crowther gathered the Spartans and the entire Black Daggers battalion four days into training to explain his plan to board and destroy Covenant ships. After seeing what the Spartans were capable of, Johnson advised Crowther to make better use of the Spartans, as the plan, as he initially laid it out, made poor use of the Spartans' immense capabilities. Johnson continued his support of the Spartans on the missions that would follow, 
and would fight by their side and impart lessons and wisdom to the Spartans throughout their time together, particularly when presented with the betrayals of a commanding officer. Johnson also conversed with Crowther about the talents of the Spartans and was involved in and present for the promotion of John 117 in a four-rank jump to the rank of Master Chief Petty Officer. During the attack on Zoist, Johnson along with the rest of the Black Daggers would be spaced by the insurrectionist sympathising crew of the UNSC Prowler Ghost Song. This would be a very close shave with death for Johnson as his heating systems had failed, nearly freezing him to death, and his air supply had all but ran out, elevating his CO2 levels to near lethal. He would, however, ultimately be recovered and would share Sweet William cigars with John 117 and watch the destruction play out from their successful operation against the Covenant world of Zoist. The years of service would continue inexorably up to the final days of the Human Covenant War. Johnson, along with Privates Besenti and O'Brien, and Private First Class Wallace Jenkins, one of the surviving members of the original militia group Johnson had trained on harvest 27 years earlier, were present during the Fall of Reach, where Johnson led a search and destroy team aboard the orbital reach station Gamma. It was here that Johnson once again encountered the Master Chief, John 117, and Linda 058. Once their mission to secure nav data was accomplished, they extracted Johnson and his team to the Pillar of Autumn. Johnson then would be present for the Battle of Installation 04 and the release of the Flood, where his previous augmentations during the Orion program would prove to be his saving grace. His sheer skill, tenacity, tactical awareness and his physiological enhancements granted by his augmentations were the very reasons he avoided being infected by the Flood. While Boron's syndrome was suggested as being a medical condition Johnson acquired following the use of a crate of Covenant grenades that gave him a 1200 rad dose of radiation, but also earned him a commendation for bravery, had altered his neural system that rendered him immune to the infection. This was, however, revealed to be a falsehood. It was a cover story to hide his involvement in the classified Orion program, and in truth, his survival was owed only to his skill and augmented capabilities rather than a medical immunity. In spite of living through this, however, Johnson had to endure watching his entire squad, including Jenkins, one of his longest serving soldiers, get consumed by the flood and then have to fight their reanimated corpses. The gory details of Johnson's time on Installation 04 would be some of the darkest days of Johnson's military career. He ultimately survived and managed to escape the ring along with a few survivors in a pelican that would be found by the Master Chief and Cortana shortly thereafter. Johnson would once again fight alongside the Master Chief as they took control of the Covenant flagship Ascendant Justice, their return to Reach, and the location of the surviving Spartans and their first strike against the unyielding Hierophant. While being able to shake off the events of Installation 04 and the following grotesqueries with trademark humour and grit, this evidently left a mark on Johnson as, following his commendation with the Colonial Cross, his attachment to the UNSC in Amberclad and his defence of the Earth City of New Mombasa, when in Amberclad pursued the Prophet of Regret's carrier through a slipspace portal, his horror is palpable when it is revealed they had arrived at the location of yet another Halo. Cortana, what exactly am I looking at? That is another Halo. <laughs> Say what? So this is what my father found. For a soldier as experienced as Johnson, with his service record, Orion augmentations, 30 years fighting insurrectionists and a further 27 years fighting alien aggressors, to shake him to the point that he nearly chokes on his cigar, and obvious shock and fear can be seen in his eyes, speaks volumes to just how deeply the events of Installation 04 affected him. Nevertheless, with trademark Johnson grit, he performed his duties and assisted Master Chief and the other Marine forces on the ring to accomplish their missions, as well as directly assisting Commander Miranda Keyes in obtaining the activation index of the installation before being captured by the Covenant. Having been attacked by the Arbiter and then dragged away by Tartarus and his brutes, Johnson would be imprisoned on the Covenant Holy City of High Charity before the Prophet of Truth ultimately kicked into action the Great Schism, a Covenant civil war that saw the elites rebelling against the Covenant 
and then instructing Tartarus to take the humans to the ring to use them to activate the halo and begin the great journey. Miranda was ultimately chosen to be the human to activate the ring, while Johnson was left behind to be executed alongside other captured marines. Before his execution could be carried out, however, the Arbiter and loyal elites and hunters attacked the would-be executioners, giving Johnson the opportunity to escape and commandeer a scarab. Listen, you don't like me and I sure as hell don't like you. But if we don't do something, Mr. Mohawk's gonna activate this ring and we're all gonna die. A tenuous alliance was forged between Johnson and the Arbiter in the face of their collective annihilation. Seeing Johnson breaching the control room and assisting the Arbiter in the assault, attack on and execution of Tartarus and his brutes, and the prevention of the ring from firing. Here that Johnson, Miranda, and the Arbiter learned of the Ark and the ability to activate all Halos from its location. Johnson would then accompany Miranda and the Arbiter back to Earth to warn humanity. Johnson would go on to interrogate a Covenant engineer regarding the specifics of the Forerunner artifact being uncovered in East Africa and would be dispatched to recover the Master Chief upon his jump from the Forerunner keyship. I don't know, Sergeant Major. Radio for Vito. Heavy lift gear. We're not leaving him here. Following a brief defense of Earth, Johnson accompanied the UNSC and elites through the Void Portal to the Ark, where he assisted in securing a landing zone for the UNSC Ford under Dawn. Following this, he would lead 2nd Squad in taking down the 3rd Shield Barrier in order to gain access to the Citadel where Truth and his remaining forces were hiding and preparing to activate the Halo Array. Johnson would be captured once again and taken to the Citadel, as Truth knew only a Reclaimer, or rather, a member of humanity, could activate the rings. Johnson tried desperately to taunt the Brute Chieftains into killing him, thereby denying Truth the ability to activate the rings. However, Miranda Keyes would attack the Citadel with a pelican and thus put an end to that endeavour. He attempted to convince Miranda to kill him, and then herself to prevent the rings from being fired, but before she could, she was gunned down by Truth. This demoralised Johnson enough to put up little fight to being forced to fire the rings. Before they could actually fire, however, the Master Chief, the Arbiter and a horde of allied Flood would arrive to stop the firing and kill Truth, finally ending the war between the Covenant and humanity. You must be silenced. The Flood, now free of the threat of the Halos, turned once again on the Three. Johnson managed to escape with Miranda's body, leaving Chief and Arbiter to fight their way out. After the discovery of a replacement halo in the Ark's forges, the opportunity to wipe out the Flood while also sparing all other life in the galaxy presented itself. Johnson would go on to aid the Master Chief, the newly recovered Cortana and the Arbiter in their efforts to activate the partially constructed ring and destroy the Flood threat. He would fight alongside the Master Chief and the Arbiter through hordes of Flood as they made their way to the control room of the replacement Halo. Within, 343 Guilty Spark was making final preparations. When Johnson revealed that they intended to fire the ring immediately, 
Spark attempted to dissuade and argue that a premature firing would destroy the installation and severely damage the Ark. Johnson proceeded to attempt activation, but was gunned down by the rampant monitor as it desperately attempted to protect its installation. The monitor's laser weapon would splash across Johnson's chest, burning away his armour and causing severe, penetrative and cauterized third degree burns to his chest, likely severely burning his lungs in the process. Despite what would have been one of the most agonizing of injuries, Johnson regained consciousness long enough to fire his Spartan laser and briefly disable the monitor, then handing his weapon over to the Master Chief to allow him to finally kill the monitor. Johnson would regain consciousness once more to hand Cortana's chip back to the Master Chief, instilling one last piece of advice to his old friend and delivering one final request. I'm getting you out of here. No, no, you're not. No, don't let her go. Don't ever let her go. Send me out. Sergeant Major Avery J. Johnson died on December the 11th, 2552, 18 days after his 78th birthday. As a man of his age, he was in impeccable condition and was devout to his fellow man and for the greater good of the entirety of his life. As a soldier, he was among the finest that humanity had to offer. His steadfast determination, his grit and skill were nearly unsurpassed. His Orion augmentations likely lent to his long life and level of physical fitness even into his late 70s. But his ability to endure all that he had for his near 60 years of military service were not solely due to his enhancements. They were not solely due to his training nor his experience. They were the culmination of a lifetime in service of humanity that far surpassed the sum of its parts and were made possible because beneath his armor, beneath its experience, beneath his training and his rank, his wit, his dry sense of humor, he was a man with a mind as sharp as razor blades and a heart dedicated to seeing humanity through its darkest days. He was the product of an era, the soldier of a generation, and a man of incalculable prestige. He paved the way for humanity's survival, and every day that humanity continues to see is owed in no small part by the life and death of Sergeant Avery J. Johnson. someone cutting onions around here or something so i hope you enjoyed this episode of service records for the record there is actually another video i made quite a long time ago now that looked into possible law implications that could suggest that there is at least a narrow chance that johnson may have survived his encounter with 343 guilty spark i've linked the video in the description and it will be in the cards at the very end of this video give it a watch and tell me what you think I'll also be chasing this video up with a look into the Orion augmentations and speculate a little bit on exactly what they entailed, so look out for that one. And until next time, thanks for watching. If you're new here and liked what you saw, go ahead and hit that like button and hit the subscribe button while you're at it so you don't miss my future uploads. Links are in the description to get connected and jump into the Discord community with me, and if you really love the content I'm making, consider supporting the channel over on Patreon for tons of awesome perks. 
pop your comments down below if you have an idea of what I should cover next, and hang around for the end of the video for other suggested videos you might be interested in. Huge shouts to my patrons, Spartan10148, the metarch of my installation, Falcon, Prophet, Phantom, Thomas, Mikhail, and Irrefutable Justice, my monitors, Andrew, Cameron, Darian, Flaming Halo, Madness, Mast Owl, Michael, Spartan0137, The Cave Potato, Uwu Master, and Wolf Eclipse, my sub-monitors, my growing fleet of Strato Sentinels, my ever-vigilant Enforcers, and all the other awesome patrons that are helping to support the channel in a big, big way. Huge shout out to Todd Morrison for keeping the installation powered with that glorious vacuum energy. Much love to you all, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.